again. I wasn't even looking for anything in particular, just scrolling Marketplace, and I came across the cheapest aluminum supercharged mini jet boat I have ever seen for sale by a big margin. And on top of that, it was local. And when I say local, I mean really local. This thing was six minutes down the road from my house. So, you know, one of those things, those are at least my justifications. It was very hard to pass up and uh, here it is. So let me give you the rundown of this thing. Uh, if you're not familiar with this kind of subgenre of boat, basically it's an all aluminum hull. So the entire thing is made out of aluminum. It's fabricated, it's welded together. And that allows you to reach some pretty remote places because aluminum will generally bend before it cracks or shatters or breaks like fiberglass wood. So that means you can, you know, jump logs, jump sandbars. You can get pretty, pretty crazy with these things. So it's a built aluminum hull, but then with a full jet ski drivetrain. So it's kind of simple, full, out of a donor jet ski drivetrain in an aluminum hull. Now, a lot of companies sell these as kits that you put together yourself, which is something I was considering doing. I first came across these when I saw Blake Wilkie's, and I was like, man, if I had to put a list together of what I would want in a, a little ripper boat, that, that would be it, you know? So I started looking into building one, and then sometime after that is when Cletus and James built theirs, and seeing the process, I realized it was, it was definitely a lot of work. You always underestimate how much work it is. It was gonna take a lot of time, and time that I just didn't really have with uh, all the other projects that are always stacking up, so I shelved it. I did look into buying one that was already built, but they were generally just incredibly expensive for kind of a well-optioned, well-equipped one. So that's why when I found this one, I, I had to jump on it. So this particular hull is a Metal Union hull, which is actually a company out of Florida, so they mainly, it seems like from what I could gather, they do, you know, just general fab work. Um, but they also build these holes. Uh, I would assume they built the trailer as well. It says Metal Union on it. It is a nice trailer, I like it. It's got a step here, it's got a step here, it's got the plastic here over the fenders to protect the boat. So overall, the hole is pretty nice. You know, it's got grab rails on the front and back. It's got, you know, flush mount cleats that pop up. It's got a lot of nice little features. I will say at first, I was not a fan of the the look of the boat, you'd be surprised how different these things can look for kind of roughly the same size. This in particular is an 11 foot. So they generally range from 10 to 12 feet. This one's smack dab in the middle. But from the back, I do really like the way this looks. And I think once we get a different wrap on it, it'll look really good. I'm not at all a fan of this wrap. I don't really drink. So having a boat that's wrapped as a beer is just not really, not really up my alley. So that's obviously easy and gives us the opportunity to change the look. I think it'll look pretty cool with what I've got in store. So I do really like how they brace the skid plate for the jet drive. This thing is incredibly well protected uh, with all the tubing tied in. So this, it looks very durable. Looks like you could get real wild with this thing. It's got the transom tie down hooks. Uh, overall, it seems to be a well-built hole. You know, nothing I could find that that didn't look good. There's a lot of welding on here, so it's all really good. It all looks very structurally sound. So moving on to the engine, and this is what really made this particular boat a good deal, because I've seen a lot of these for sale at a similar price point, but generally with naturally aspirated engines, you know, 150 to 180 horsepower engines, which is a good amount in a jet ski and can push a jet ski pretty quick, but when you put that in a big aluminum hole that's going to be much heavier, it's not gonna be all that fast. And Around here, we like to go fast. I wanna go fast. So this particular boat has a 260 horsepower supercharged Sea Dew engine in it. So it's got a good amount of power. It's got good upgrade potential. We have a lot of options with this engine, but as, as it sits, it's, it's a really good power and size for this boat. Now in the engine bay here, everything's you know pretty well done. I like the way they did a lot of the piping for the intercooler and the exhaust and all of that, everything's pretty solid there. One thing I do really like is this fabricated fuel tank because it uses the stock jet ski fuel hat, fuel cinder, fuel pump and everything. So it keeps everything simple in OEM, but with a much larger tank that's better fitted to the boat. The wiring, it's none of it's bad. It's just, you know, if I was doing it, I'd prefer it to be a little bit neater and tidier, not wound with electrical tape, a little better secured. Um, but for the most part, for now, it'll work. Something we can revisit later on, but here are the uh, drivetrain fuse boxes that came out of the jet ski, I would assume. And then this is basically a fuse and relay box for all the accessories on the boat, all the additional stuff. It is converted to pick up water from the river or whatever water you're riding around in. 
Uh, that is one thing with these engines is they factory come with a closed circuit cooling system. So they have basically a radiator and a self-contained cooling system as opposed to picking up the water that you're riding in and cycling that. Um, so it has all the provisions to adapt that. It does have this really large basket area over here, which is pretty neat. I like that. You could definitely store a lot of stuff in there. It's got a kill switch. I definitely like to probably put a new battery in it and maybe do two, just, just to be thorough because you need power for your bilge pumps and stuff and that's something you don't want to lose and maybe a nicer kill switch. There's some odds and ends there, but for the most part, this stuff works. Now, where we have a problem is the hoses. Now, this thing's only a few years old, but all of these hoses and hose clamps are just incredibly corroded. You can see down there. I just want to go through and replace all of the hoses because obviously if one of those bursts, it's basically just pumping water into the hole, which is not ideal. So one of these, it's this one back here you can't really see, uh, developed a leak while we were riding and was obviously filling with water. So we had to cut our ride a little bit short. So obviously that's something we absolutely need to fix before we take this thing out on the water. But it's, I think it's a good idea to do it anyway, just kind of cheap insurance. Fortunately, they're all just regular rubber hoses. So it should be pretty straightforward to replace them. It's not like they're all specialty molded hoses that we need specific replacements of. Pretty straightforward. Uh, otherwise, it seems to run good. It seemed to drive good. All of that seemed well. We won't really know till we take it on a long run up the water if there are any more unforeseen issues, but that's kind of part of it. When you buy a boat, that's a good deal. You're generally gonna have to put in some, uh, some elbow grease. To, to fix the odds and ends, which I'm totally cool with because I'll be able to fix it up myself and make it how I want it. So uh, one thing with the drivetrain is you've got this reverse bucket here, which this is like a fabricated reverse bucket. And whoever designed this didn't have a ton of forethought or maybe it wasn't designed for this bow, I don't know. But if it looks like it would work fine and blast the water out and you can use it as a brake and it's really cool. However, when you put it down, these blast the water onto the skid plate, which blasted against the transom, which blasted up in the air, which blasted all over you. So at the moment with this reverse bucket, you literally pretty much can't use reverse unless you want to get wet. As soon as you put it down, water starts going everywhere. So we need to fix that. I think we can cut these off and just clock them basically down at the same angle that this is and uh, it'll solve that problem. Uh, so that's pretty much the hole. Um, as you can see, we've got the you know, flush mounted cleats back here as well. We've got our vents on both sides for our blowers. We've got our bilge pump exit. Uh, I am gonna add a second backup bilge pump with another exit just because these boats do tend to take on water. It's a welded aluminum boat. You're gonna have pinholes. And then on top of that, this one has the plastic sheeting under it to allow it to slide. This is almost like nonstick, right? So not only does it protect the aluminum hole from bashes and gouges and things like that, but it allows you to slide over sandbars and stuff more easily. This one's even got a second layer right down here at the V. So that's a lot of holes and they're, you're guaranteed to have some weakened. So point is, I wanna make sure that uh, we have enough bilge pump for this thing for any potential scenario. Uh, moving on to the interior. So I do really like the cockpit on this thing. It's got actually a lot of cool stuff in here. So we've got our steering wheel here. We've got a drive-by-wire throttle control because it's a newer jet ski drivetrain. We've got our, you know, our buttons that you would have on the jet ski to control stuff on the display. And then we have a trim tab. Now this doesn't work. This is something we're gonna address. I don't know how much we need it, but it'd be nice to have. I would like to change this out for a full steering wheel. I'm not a fan of the fighter jet thing. Just kind of, I don't know. I want a full steering wheel, but that's, that's easy peasy. Here we have our key fob. I did just fix this. I managed to find, it didn't have a bulkhead nut when I got it. So you had to hold it from the backside, which is really annoying. Uh, and I managed to find one on Amazon. I was pretty happy about that. So your little key fob goes on there. So weird to hear a chirp on a boat, uh, but. Obviously I don't wanna let it run on out of water, but you get the gist. Uh, we got our switch panel over here. So we got cockpit lights, which are pretty cool because they're down here in the cockpit. They're in the engine bay and on the back of the transom. Um, bilge pump, blower, all that good stuff. Nav lamps, charger. We've also got another USB charger here. Uh, but one of the really neat things is this rugged radio setup. So it's got this full rugged radio setup, 
where we can plug in the headsets. It came with a pair of these carbon fiber headsets and me and my passenger can talk to each other. It gets pretty loud in here when you're ripping on the water, you got a lot of RPM. And then this being an aluminum boat, you know, this, this is a lot of noise. So being able to put the headset on and chat back and forth with your passenger without having to yell is, it's pretty nifty. And this particular setup has Bluetooth so we can play music as well. And I can kind of change how much volume the, the music has versus us talking. So I do really like that. I don't know that I would have thought to add that, but the fact that it came with it, definitely a nice feature. Uh, we've obviously got the typical, pretty much every boat has this, speakers up here, speakers down here in the footwell, and then this uh, Bluetooth receiver setup to power them all. Works pretty good, um, but honestly, you'd probably be listening to music most of the time through the headset anyway. But one of the really neat things is this Garmin GPS. Uh, so this is pretty neat because we've got a full touchscreen GPS. We've got nav chart, we've got fishing chart. We've got a 3D chart if we want to use that. Uh, so pretty cool. Um, again, not something I necessarily would have added, but definitely an expensive thing to have in here. Cool that it came with it. So got that. We got cup holders. We got a grab handle for the passenger. Um, and then we've got our forward and reverse here. There is some, I need to do some inspection on this uh, from the drive this, this you're in forward, but if you push it all the way forward. The cables kind of bind a little bit on the steering. You kind of got to have it here. Um, so something I want to look into on that. One of the, one of the things we'll need to take care of, uh, but it's got this decent C decking in here down on the bottom, all up on the sides. I feel like this is absolutely crucial in an aluminum boat. So when you're in here without shoes on, you've got soft surfaces. You're not standing on an aluminum boat. I don't know that I'll change this. This this stuff's like pretty decent, but I definitely like to change it at the bow and the stern just because this stuff's kind of kind of rough. It doesn't look that great. I'd like to put some, some nicer kind of faux teak uh, sea decking on here. I think we can make it look pretty cool. It'll just kind of depend on what we end up wrapping the boat color wise. Another thing I'd like to do is maybe either delete this windshield entirely or retain it and build like a, basically a roll cage. That wouldn't be much of a roll cage because we'd probably need to do it out of aluminum, but basically just build a little structure so we can add a roof. That's how Wilkie's boat set up and I think it looks the coolest and I think it would be nice to have shade while you're cruising down the river as opposed to just being out in the open and fully exposed. I know that's kind of what boating's about, but I like shape, it gets hot here. So these really nice PRP seats, these things are super comfortable. They've got a ton of cushions, some suspension. So when you're blasting over waves and jumping stuff, you got some support. Uh, so yeah, that's pretty much the gist. So let me show you what I've got so far. I went on a slight ordering spree when I got this thing to uh, get some stuff to fix it up and outfit it, things that was missing, all that good stuff. So let me show you. So I'm still waiting on a bunch of stuff to come in. But these are just some of the kind of the basic accessories, some things that we didn't have. Um, so one of these, one of which is some transom straps. I'm a big fan of making sure things are well strapped down and not having any transom straps bothers me. Uh, I've got a new winch strap for the front, um, some dock lines. I want to make sure these fit because if I launch this thing by myself, I'm going to need to be able to hold it and walk it to the dock and tie it off while I go park the trailer. And then I've also got a new linear actuator to replace the one for the trim. So hopefully we can get the trim working. Again, I don't know the how, well, how much we need it, um, but I found one that should bolt right in and hook right up. So we might as well try to make it, make it work. So let's see if these transom straps fit before we start tearing this thing apart, pulling all the hoses out of it. That ain't going nowhere. All right, let's try out these dock lines. Is this one four foot, so this will probably be for the back. It's usually I want to hold it from the front. I got these bungee ones, so they're a little nicer to store. Oh yeah, that's pretty nifty. I really probably didn't even need the six foot one for the front. Oh, we do have this too. like you would have on a uh, side by side.
Yeah, these are pretty neat. It should work really well for what, I'm, what I need. Like I said, I could probably have got away with two forefoots, but I thought it'd be nice to have a little extra length. I'm trying to stay dry. These are going to be the quick and easy projects. So the bolt that holds the end of the winch strap on is pretty much buried. There is not really any way to get it out without taking this a little bit apart. And if you've ever worked on anything, you know that you always try to take it apart as little as you can. And then a lot of times you end up wasting time doing that because you've got to take it all the way apart anyway, which is exactly what we had to do. But eventually I got it all apart and we could pull the old winch strap off. All right, well, I got to go grab a new bolt. I have so much hardware and this is standard and it's like I, I have a metric equivalent that would work but it's not quite the right length and it has to be exact to fit in the roller so we got to run to the hardware store So now that we had the right size bolt, we could reverse process and put this thing back together. This is one of those small projects that's not that important, but it also is kind of important. So I wanted to go ahead and get it done so that way it was done. Some of these things that you might not want to do later, you got to not put them off because if you put them off, you might never do it. So we got the new winch strap on and we could tighten everything up and see if it works. All right, well, now that that's replaced, this one was probably had some life left in it, but it was getting pretty tore out. The last thing you want is for this thing to break and your boat falls off the trailer. Come here, sweetheart. Hang on, there's a lot of noises. There's a lot of noises in here. Now we got a fresh hook, fresh strap. We're good to go. Uh, so now we can move on to the actual projects. I just wanted to get that stuff off the bench. Let's move into the engine bay. All right, here's our new actuator. It looks like it's definitely the same. So that is good news for us. Just gotta find the right combo of tools. swap it in anyway but before we do might as well test the old one and the new one I'm hoping that the old one does not work if it does then that means that we have a wiring problem instead of a hardware problem yep yeah, well this one works should be a reversible area you bring it in, yep. All right, well, that's good news. This one, yeah, it's not doing anything. All right, we should get this, this off. Another standard hardware situation where I would love to replace this bolt, but it goes into a heim joint that's standard, so we have got to use a standard bolt, which of course is a little bit too large for the end of this actuator. So we drilled it out so the new bolt will fit, got the lock nut on there and the jam nut, and then we can try to install this thing and see if we can make this work. I'm hoping that it does work just off the bat. You know, we've got the wiring there, the button's all wired. That's all the annoying stuff. Just replacing the actuator is not too bad, but this bracket was just a little bit off where the holes were. So it was definitely a struggle trying to get all of the holes lined up. I had to play around with extending and retracting the actuator a little bit to get everything to line up. But once we got it there, it was pretty easy to just bolt it together, hook the wiring up and test it out. All right, moment of truth time. It works.
I'm gonna take off the, what should be the trim cable. It doesn't seem like it's doing anything at the back here. I'm trying to see if this cable's locked up. Take a gander, tell me if it moves. So we've got three inches to the... Still three inches. Uh, you wouldn't really be able to trim it anyway. Because as you go up with this, this distance changes. And then you end up with... Basically, you got bumps here. All right, well, I'm done messing with the cables, <laughs> the trim, and I mean, we got it working-ish, you know? Uh, obviously, it's not really gonna work the way you would think anyway, so we're gonna shelve that. We know the boat rides fine. If we have any issues with the way it rides, we can mess with that, then revise it, do all that. I wanna move on to this bucket. We know that this does not work. <laughs> it is absolutely useless. We could just plate these off and make this kind of like a normal reverse bucket. But since we have these, I think I'm gonna go ahead and just re-clock them down, which should bring the water under the skid plate here and solve our problem. So we gotta unbolt this, cut it, grind all this powder coating off and uh, weld it up. Another downside to the way these reverse elbows are oriented is one of the bolts is just virtually impossible to get an Allen key on. If it wasn't an Allen, this wouldn't be a problem because you could just get on it with a wrench. But of course, it's another, uh, guess, guess, can you guess? It's another standard bolt with a lock nut and I don't have a great selection of lock nuts and I could see why I would want lock nuts in this scenario. So we got it off. We'll, we'll revisit that once we re-clock these. We'll see if it's still a nuisance. So. Went ahead and started cutting them, and this is one of those scenarios where more work could be less work. I'm cutting, and it, the bandsaw is just cutting the slowest it's ever cut in its life. I need to change the bandsaw blade, but that's going to take time. So do I want to just you suffer through this cut and then change it later? And uh, that's what I did. So it just barely got through cutting these. They are pretty thick, these elbows. They they must be cast elbows because they are really, really thick material. So once we got it all cut apart, I'm going to clean it up as best I can. The less stuff, the less junk we have on here, the better this is going to weld. Anytime you're TIG welding, it's important to have clean material, but it is the most important with aluminum because as you're welding on AC, stuff will bubble up to the surface and those contaminants and that junk will get into your weld puddle and just make your job an absolute nightmare. So I cleaned them up as best I could apart from completely cleaning the whole thing and every bit of powder coating off. And then we mocked them up on the boat to see what orientation we wanted to lock these in at so that we can go ahead and put a couple tacks on them and then we will double check. It's always important to double check even though I'm pretty sure this is good. I also went ahead and cleaned up the holes. You know me, can't have these uh, scraggly holes. But uh, with them all tacked on, everything looks good. All the measurements work out so it's time to weld these out. Well, that should do the trick. I'm uh, pretty happy with how that turned out. The welding was actually pretty good. I was expecting it to not be very fun being, you know, powder coated aluminum, not getting a chance to clean it all off, but it welded pretty clean, minimal contaminants. I was definitely surprised. So I think that should either fix or most of the way resolve our problem. So uh, moving on, I did not expect to get this this quickly. I ordered this yesterday after talking about it and it's here. It is a three bolt, which is what we've got up here on the steering wheel. If you can even call that a steering wheel. Two six bolt adapter. So we can use a normal, you know, race car steering wheel. This isn't long term the steering wheel I want to use. It's just one I had lying around off the E36. So 
for uh, proof of concept. We'll give this thing a shot. Try it out. Now, the only thing is, our button situation, we are gonna have to determine what to do with these buttons. Obviously, the trim, we've learned, does virtually nothing. These, I don't really know how much they're gonna get used. Obviously, the throttle will for sure have to make work. Uh, but if we can, I'd like to kind of just move these over, maybe to the dash, and then just have the throttle and the steering wheel. But we'll see, we gotta get this apart first, and then see what we're working with. So fortunately, the hub adapter did fit. I was a little worried this would be some oddball, unique three bolt, but it wasn't. So now it's just time to figure out how to get these controls to work on this steering wheel. That's gonna be the trickiest part of all of this because the steering wheel that was on it is meant and made for these controls and has spots to bolt everything on. And this is not, this is just a regular car steering wheel. So I experimented with a couple of throttle placements and any which way we do it is gonna require us doing some modifications to either the wheel or the throttle bracket. So I also went ahead and tested to make sure that everything worked before I tore it the rest of the way apart. I really don't know what the hell this button is for. I don't really need this and I don't really need that. So really all this boils down to is if we can get the throttle to work on this steering wheel or not. All right, well, I want this to work and I don't care much about this steering wheel. This is the only thing I'll potentially ever use it on. So I'm gonna try, basically, it's too thick for the clamp. And I could get longer bolts, but it's still, I don't know if the bolts are even gonna line up. So what I'm gonna try to do is cut a notch down to the frame of this wheel. And then maybe, if we're lucky, can bolt it on and the wheel not completely fray apart. Oh my gosh, it worked. It definitely worked. All right, let me burn these ends. That honestly went way better than I could have expected. The only question mark I have, well, I might have made that a little tight. No, it's good, it fits perfect. Is it gonna be at an angle? Oh, see, it's a little loose now, which we can't be having that. So let's wrap this with some tape. Mm, still needs a little bit more. I can move it, I don't want that. That's nice though. With it angled a little bit, with it on the old steering wheel, kind of get in the way of your, your finger, you kind of, end up throttling onto your finger because you couldn't get your hand down far enough. So now, all right, I need more tape though. Um. Sick. All right, now our only problem is, hello. I swear this was the right size. It is. Uh, mounting this stuff somewhere. Again, we don't really need it. That's, that's smooth. Smooth as silk. Oh gosh. I really don't know what this button does, so I'm just gonna snip these. My hope is that we can de this enough to get the throttle one out by itself. And then we can just tuck this one under there and if we ever need to get to it, we can, but we, I don't see a reason. With the throttle on the steering wheel, the rest of this is pretty simple. I did also consider trying to do a four mounted throttle, but I couldn't really find anything great that would work with a four foot pedal with the drive-by wire setup. We could make something work, but to get this working now, it, this works. 
this works. And that way we can try it and see if we like the hand throttle or we want to switch to a foot throttle. So fortunately, we were also able to split the loom up enough to spread out these two plugs since they're not going to the same place anymore and get the button pad for the instrument cluster mounted up under the dash as well as the trim pad in case we ever need them. And fortunately, it's not that many buttons to keep track of. So if we ever do need to use it, it's there, but it's also not in your face and in the way all the time if we don't need it. All right, steering wheel swap done. That was way better. Before and after. I am so happy with that. That came out nice. It matches the color, which obviously we're gonna change anyway, but it matches for now. I think I might wanna get a spacer. It's just, I mean, it's, it's not any further away than this was, but it just feels a little, I like my wheels close. So I might get a spacer, space it back some. We'll see, we'll see after our water tests. I might like it the way it is. Um, but we got a round steering wheel now, which makes me happy. I'll hang on to this. I still don't know what this button's for, but it doesn't seem like I need it. I fired it up and it ran, so who knows. Um, so I do have where to go. Another part that came in today was my bilge pump bulkhead. So we're gonna put that one there. That'll be for our secondary bilge pump, which was also supposed to be here today, but as usual, it got delayed a couple days. So we don't have that yet, but we'll probably put it somewhere on this side, the main bilge pumps on the other side, uh, just in case. Probably totally unnecessary to have two bilge pumps on a small boat like this, but if that one gets clogged up or just stops working, we at least have another one pumping water out of this thing and we don't have to worry about it. So we'll get that tossed in. It's just kind of added insurance. We've also got a sand trap that came with the boat. The guy I bought the boat from had ordered one through a local jet boat guy and he has it and it's paid for. I just gotta go pick it up. So we need to get that because that will go in our cooling system, which is what all of the hoses that we are replacing. But we definitely need to get those all changed. Any one of them could spring a leak at really any moment. I'm so tempted to just change that one hose with the pinhole and take this thing out on the water tomorrow. I am so eager to drive it. I've wanted a boat for years and years now, and specifically one of these boats. And uh, to finally have found the right deal at the right time and to have it in my possession, it is really hard not to just take this thing straight down to the river. But I wanna cover all my bases first, make sure it's solid, it's sorted, we can just take it out and enjoy it and not have to worry about it. It'll just be more fun that way. And then obviously after that, once we work out any bugs and make sure it's dialed mechanically, we can start working on the upgrade, you know, rewrapping it, new C deck and all that good stuff. So yeah, that being said, we are out of parts and we're out of time. So you know what that means. I'm gonna go ahead and end it here, but uh, let me know what you guys think of the new jet boat. Let me know what upgrades and suggestions you have as far as what we should do to this thing, change, check, and uh, yeah, I think that's it. So thanks for watching, thanks for subscribing. I'll see you next time for hopefully a water test once I get that stuff sorted. So get it sorted, water test, hopefully, hopefully it goes well. So I'll see you for that, but for now, that's it, goodbye.